Once upon a time, in an ancient land in the cold and distant north, there lived a red-headed little girl of ten. She was a brave and feisty little whirlwind, prone to mischief and misdemeanor, besting even the rowdiest of her boy siblings in both tame games and tomfoolery. And at her young age, the little fiery spark had a bold and daring dream. On the blissfully warm summer day she turned ten, she promised herself that before she turned twenty, she would one day storm the haunted castle up the misty mountain, and break its ancient curse. For the red-headed child was that kind of person. A hopeless romantic and an insatiable dreamer who believed the world was full of magic and adventure, despite the wearisome monotony of everyday life. The ancient castle up the foreboding mountain was practically a ruin. Its once massive and intimidating high walls are now cracked, and some sections have even caved in. Once proud turrets are now sagging, and some seem to have lost hope and have altogether collapsed. Once beautiful stained glass windows have dulled, cracked, and were broken through the centuries of disrepair. The once majestic courtyard is now overgrown with scraggly trees and stubborn weeds, that seem to viciously bicker and nag at each other whenever a stray wind mistakenly enters the derelict grounds. The dark and empty castle halls with the sadly stained and cracked chamber walls were now visited only by errant dust motes that comfortably settled down in every nook and cranny here and there, amongst the layers of grime built up through the centuries of neglect. Wooden furniture have rotted down to bare bones, and all things fabric from proud tapestries to heraldic banners to draperies, upholsteries, blankets, and sheets, have been eaten away by mould and mildew. Walls were water-stained and the palace floors were dotted here and there with stagnant stinking puddles of what hopefully was once water. Even metals have succumbed to the relentless and unforgiving onslaught of time and decay. Rust and necrotic-looking patina were everywhere where any metal was left. Beautiful things such as paintings, decors, and statues, were not spared, for they too surrendered to time and neglect, and not even a whispering ghost of their former beauty was left. Everything was in desperately sad dilapidation and decay. Except for the large garden maze in the grounds between the castle courtyard and the nearby forest. If anything, the maze of thorny thick hedges appeared to thrive amidst the general deterioration and neglect. The brick path that wended through it left and right remained perfectly flat throughout the silent centuries, never invaded by nary a hardy weed that tend to stubbornly grow through the smallest of gaps. The thorny hedge walls of the maze remained immaculately trimmed, not a stray leaf or twig in sight and these partitions of greenery remained perfectly flat and vertical. Nothing foreign to the maze littered the winding pathways and nothing wild or feral made a home amongst the hedges. Everything was as prim and proper in their own right, much like on the day the maze was last used by the castle's former inhabitants and true owners. This was not unexpected for a caretaker lived in a nearby cottage, and homely smoke was wafting from its chimney, and a whiff of brewing tea was interlaced in the wind. The caretaker of the maze was the last remaining inhabitant of the castle. He was not a descendant but one who actually lived with the royal family when they were still about, in an unremembered time lost in distant memory. And he sadly witnessed when the majestic court finally left many forgotten centuries ago. For he was an elf, an elegantly proud, beautiful, and long-lived member of that grand and glorious race that benevolently ruled the land in the time of great legends, and the infancy of the race of men. The dawning of a new era arrived, and the time came for the elves to journey into the west. Some of their kind boarded beautiful flying ships that floated into the westward skies, some of them boarded majestic sailing ships that commanded the winds and glided over the westward seas. Others rode on magnificent gilded wagons that rumbled the ground on the great overland journey to the west, drawn by giant and elegantly beautiful war horses. 
and some, like the inhabitants of the castle, entered secret passages to their future home towards where the sun sets. These passages were highways and byways made from the stuff of dreams, and they magically took a traveller from their origin to their destination. It's been said in the most ancient of ancient elven lore, that these passages are the interconnected roots of the ancient trees that dot the land here and there. Magical trees that were strategically planted by the elves themselves. Whatever the case, this was how the once inhabitants of the forlorn castle journeyed to the west. For at the center of the maze was one of the magical ancient trees. And if one knew the spell, one could command the tree to split at the center, to form an arching magical gateway that led to wherever one desired. And it's been said that through these trees, the realm of the elves and the realms of the known world were bridged. Before the elven king left, the last to enter the magical gate formed by the tree, he sadly bade his seventh son farewell. For that was the responsibility of the elven kingdoms that tended and used these magical trees. The trees embody the very essence of their magic, and must never be left alone to fend for itself. Each elven tree kingdom must leave a steward, born of royal blood, one who will watch over the enchanted tree for as long as it lived. And together with that responsibility was attached a caveat. The elven stewards must distance themselves from the emerging world, ushered in by the dawning new era, for this is no longer their age. They must never interfere, nor intervene, nor must they make themselves known. At the time of the fiery little redhead, 21 majestic elves remain watching and protecting 21 magical trees that bridged the known realms and the realm of the elves. And as they oversaw the well-being of their trees, they lived in seclusion, hiding in solitude, coldly witnessing the age of men, never interfering, and silently watching. Perhaps it was a mistake, or perhaps it was fate. For to occupy the centuries, the elven prince in the castle ruin decided to maintain the maze, instead of letting it fall into disrepair, like everything else. He kept it as pristine as it was on the day he last saw his family and friends. First as a hobby, then as a reminder, then just as something trivial to do, to preoccupy himself throughout the decades, as they piled on to centuries. He decided long ago that he would destroy the maze with magical fire when men started to inhabit the nearby forests and foothills. The day finally came to burn down the maze, but he was never able to do so. For on the second to the last day of autumn of that year, as he emerged from his cottage, a beautiful and strong red-headed young lady of almost twenty, was curiously standing in front of the maze entrance, staring inwards. On the early morning of that fateful day, after a hike up the foreboding mountain that began well past midnight, the beautiful young red-headed lady stared in disappointment at the castle ruins. After a desultory inspection that grew more and more half-hearted by the minute, she finally decided that no curse would be worth breaking in this sad, sorry, and forsaken wreck of a castle. Everything was ramshackle and run down. Nothing was left unscathed by the indiscriminate ravage of time. Her heart sank further in disappointment, for tomorrow was to be the eve of her twentieth birthday, and she promised herself long ago to break some castle's curse before she got to be two decades old. So she went outside for a cursory look at the castle grounds, expecting to see the same sorry state of deterioration and decrepitude. But to her pleasant surprise, she delightfully discovered the pristine garden maze. There was no trace of fear in her, as she ran smiling towards the cottage which she correctly assumed to be that of the caretakers. But the elves are normally invisible to non-magical creatures such as men, and they will only be visible when the elves wanted to be seen. And the homely cottage was likewise protected by deceptive enchantment. The young beauty never noticed nor even slightly felt the presence of the elven prince, as she brushed past him towards the cottage door. 
After several unanswered knocks, she hesitantly went in, and was shocked to discover an old lady slumped on a small table, tea and crockery spilled and smashed on the floor. It appeared to her that the old woman, who she presumed to be the caretaker, had just suffered heart failure mere moments ago. For the slumping figure was still warm, and the tea in the kettle by the stove was still steeping. The enchanted illusion was designed to discourage wandering visitors, for anyone who wouldn't be bothered to take care of a dead or almost dying old stranger would have left the place immediately. But the redhead was not the usual type of wandering visitor, for she was as compassionate as she was headstrong. So instead of running away, she tried to revive the old lady as best she could, and transferred the old woman to the bed. Despite her best efforts, the deceased elderly woman slowly grew stiff and cold. Never one to easily cower or cry, the willful redhead bravely waited through the day and through the night for someone to come home. In the afternoon of the next day, unable to wait any longer, the sympathetic young redhead unknowingly buried a rag doll that was enchanted to look like a deceased old woman. She respectfully made the grave at the back of the cottage, and offered prayers for the old woman's peaceful repose. All this, the invisible elven prince watched in silence. That very same day, the eve of her twentieth birthday, the red-headed young lady of almost twenty, entered the maze hoping to solve the puzzle of twisting and winding passages within the labyrinth. The goal, she decided, was to reach the center of the maze in order to claim conquest. And only in doing so, will she be able to honestly tell herself that the childhood promise she made so long ago has finally been fulfilled. A maze to solve is much like a curse to break, and it's best if we get on with it four times a waste in she muttered to herself then went in. For the red-headed young lady was that kind of person, a hopeless romantic and an insatiable dreamer who believed the world was full of magic and adventure, despite the wearisome monotony of everyday life. But unbeknownst to her, the labyrinth too was enchanted. By some magical design, it was significantly much larger inside than it seemed on the outside. And as if that were not enough, the maze could shift its passages left or right, open or close its corridors, and block or divert paths. And the true route in the maze passed through four consecutive courts representing the cycle of seasons, before reaching the center of the maze where it keeps a great secret. From the main entrance, anyone who enters the maze of thorny hedges would find themselves in the blissfully warm court of summer. Here, they would wander on, under a golden light and a cheery breeze. Insects would be heard busily buzzing about in the labyrinth's walls, and the corridors of hedges would be echoing with bird song. There would be the occasional showers and drizzles along the path, but these serve more to refresh rather than to drench, for the raindrops are keen to quickly dry out. And if one were particularly observant, one could spot small clusters of dark purple berries here and there, hidden amongst the thick leafy hedge walls. In the court of autumn, the wanderer will observe that the leaves of the hedges have noticeably thinned out and have changed colors. The maze's paths would be strewn with constantly flurrying fallen leaves that never stay in one place, driven ever onwards by incessant gusts of air that tirelessly sweep the ground. Notable too would be the ever-present nippy chill in the restless breeze. Aside from which, the light would be dimmer, and the ambient sounds would be slightly muffled, as if nature suddenly decided to talk in hushed whispers under a waning light. In the court of winter, the thick and impenetrable thorny hedges are barren and covered with silvery frost and powdery snow. The path would likewise be filled with snow banks that drift and shift due to the ever-present winter winds. Snow would constantly be falling, but the accumulated layer of snowflakes on the ground never builds up, for they are constantly being swept away by wintry gusts that race through the maze's corridors. Icicles randomly form here and there, amidst the bare hedges, 
and these promptly break off and fall to the ground upon reaching a certain length. And last along the way to the center of the maze would be the court of spring. Here, the harsh winter suddenly disappears to give way to radiantly beautiful morning light, with a mild temperate breeze filled with sounds of bird and insect chirping. The hedge walls in this court have a lively verdant flush, profusely sprinkled with paler colored flourishing leaf shoots. In addition, the menacing presence of thorns is infinitely softened by the dotting of delicate little fragrant white flowers that never fall to the ground. At the center of the giant maze is a meadow carpeted with lush scrub, profusely sprinkled with a bountiful abundance of many colored little flowers. And at the center of this field stands one of the O-inspiring magical ancient elven trees. Golden morning light and a slight breeze constantly caresses the hidden meadow, and the carpeting foliage lazily dances in synchronized rhythm with the gentle wind. By its very nature, the vibrant meadow completes the natural beauty of the center of the maze, but the resplendent and magnificent tree at the center of the clearing crowns it with breathtaking majesty. But the young lady never knew any of these. It was summertime, and so the inside of the labyrinth where she stood was likewise sunny and warm. But try as she might, she never got any farther in the maze, not any closer to the court of autumn. For the enchanted maze was awakened, and it perfunctorily executed its magical design. With what could almost pass as enjoyment, it randomly shifted its paths and redirected corners and turns. With what almost seemed like glee, it mixed and matched blinds, dead ends, straightaways, and cul-de-sacs. With seeming pleasure, it rearranged its corridors and closed up passages and opened up walls. With almost animate relish, it strove to lead the young redhead terribly astray, for such was its enchanted design. All afternoon the lady went at it. And all afternoon, she found herself ending up right where she started, at the entrance of the maze. Not even a tinge of amusement crossed the mind of the unseen elven prince, as he watched the lady's failing efforts unfold. So it was no surprise to him when she left as evening fell. Tomorrow morning, he decided, he will raise the enchanted maze to the ground with elven fire. But once again, he never got to it. For at the break of dawn the following day, the lady was back. It was the first day of summer, and it was her birthday. A combination that would have called for merrymaking and celebration for anyone else. But the strong-willed redhead was not like anyone else, for at that time, merrymaking and celebration were farthest from her mind. And this morning, there was even an intangible difference about her, for she seemed more resolute and her stance bespoke an unstoppable determination. This was to be expected, for she decided before bed the previous night to be dead serious about solving the maze in lieu of breaking an imagined curse. As a promise made in carefree childhood is a promise nonetheless. For the red-headed lady was that kind of person, a hopeless romantic and an insatiable dreamer who believed the world was full of magic and adventure, despite the wearisome monotony of everyday life. But since she was unaware of its enchantment, she never knew that her efforts were inevitably doomed to be futile. And with that, at the end of the day, all she ever accomplished was to apparently find several score more ways to double back to the maze's entrance. All this, the unseen prince wordlessly witnessed. Again the woman left in the evening, and again she returned before dawn the next day to try once more. With a fiery obstinacy reflective of her red locks, she repeatedly returned and tried again and again. Failure after failure, she trudged on, unrelentingly driven by her single-minded stubbornness. She would use strings, ribbons, shiny stones, chalk, little flags, tall flags, and any imaginable means to mark where she passed. She even tried drawing a map but to no avail. 
and after having tried everything she was certain would have worked, she finally decided that the labyrinth was enchanted. And instead of growing afraid, she became more determined to succeed. All the while, the thought of chopping a path through the maze never crossed her mind. For one thing, she wasn't a woodcutter, nor a woodcutter's daughter. For another, it was not in her nature to cheat like that. At one point, she considered setting up a bonfire, to make smoke so she could have a visible reference point as she navigated the twisting passages. But this remained just a passing thought for she considered it cheating. And besides, she realized, a bonfire could potentially be dangerous for she might accidentally burn down the maze. At another point, she considered trying the maze at night so she could use the stars as directional reference, but soon dropped the idea for she correctly reasoned out that the high wall of hedges would similarly block out the stars the same way they block out the sun. So the hours turned into days, and still she tried and failed. And the days turned into weeks, and still she tried and failed. The weeks turned into months, and still she tried and failed. Until one evening at the end of summer, after an especially hard day of almost desperate wandering, she stumbled onto a part of the labyrinth where she knew in her core she hasn't been to yet. She felt it deep in her heart, that she had entered a new part of the maze. Cautious that the night might suddenly turn chilly, as it was wont in these parts at this time of year, she planted a yellow flag to mark her last position, and reluctantly followed her map out of the maze, and left for the night. All this, the elven prince witnessed, a little confused, for the lady had finally stumbled into the court of autumn. With hope and excitement adding a bounce in her stride, the lady returned the following morning. And to her pleasant surprise, her map led her straight to the yellow flag she left the previous night. But her sudden good fortune abruptly ended there. For the whole autumn day, she found herself as lost as before, repeatedly doubling back to her yellow flag more than a dozen times. Although the afternoon was starting to grow chill, she was tired with exhaustion and discouragement. It would seem that the arduous and futile efforts she expended last summer would repeat. And repeat it did. For day in and day out she would try, and day in and day out she would invariably fail. But still she kept at it, relentlessly driven by stubborn hard-headedness, like a starving dog refusing to let go of a tasty bone. Many times it seriously crossed her mind to quit for she now realized that the labyrinth has become an unhealthy and unproductive obsession. More than once she argued with herself to drop everything, and forget about the maze, but she never changed her mind. The days gradually grew more and more tiring, as the afternoons grew colder and colder, and yet she obstinately plodded on. But a little after halfway through autumn, she finally seemed to have given up. She didn't return for a week, and the elven prince thought she had either finally relented or fallen ill. But he didn't have to wait long to find out which was which, for the young redhead returned and re-entered the maze on the last day of autumn. Perhaps it was just a final attempt in order to convince herself that it was no longer worth it anymore. Or perhaps it was her second wind. Or perhaps it was just sheer coincidence. For after a typical day of apparently aimless wandering, she was surprised to find herself in a colder than usual part of the maze, although the skies above were crisp and clear. And once more, she knew within herself that she was in a new part of the labyrinth. And because she felt the beginnings of a serious chill in the air, she planted a red flag and followed her map back to her yellow flag, then back to the entrance. As she headed home for the evening, the silently watching prince's confusion grew to concern, for the young woman had finally found her way into the court of winter. At first it appeared that the prince had been needlessly concerned, since the young lady didn't return the next day. Nor the day after that. 
and the day after that. And in the following days afterwards, the beautiful young redhead remained missing. As it turned out, unbeknownst to the prince, the lady did fall ill. She was afflicted with fever and was thus bedridden for most of the winter. Such was to be expected, for she neglected to take proper care of herself throughout summer and autumn. And it was no one's fault but her own, for she had been obstinately driven by her obsession to solve the maze. It was a harsh winter that visited that year, and the young woman's absence should have been an opportune time to destroy the labyrinth. But a fire in a frozen forest deeply covered in snow would have caused suspicion, so the prince was forced to wait for spring. And in such a way did most of the winter pass, and the maze was empty once more. Silence echoed in its thorny corridors as the winter raged on. Blizzards and winter storms came and went, and the prince silently wondered how the young lady would have reacted if she had entered the labyrinth at this time. Had she entered the maze in the dead of winter, she would have found the court of summer in full summer, and the court of autumn in full autumn. The court of winter would naturally mirror the current season. And had she been fortunate enough to reach the court of spring, she would most likely be very much surprised to find that place similarly untouched by cold wind, snow, and ice. But the story of the girl in the labyrinth seemed to have ended thought the prince, as the silent winter raged on and gripped both the land and the court of winter inside the maze. Come spring, at a time when a forest fire would no longer arouse suspicion, the maze would be no more. But once again, that distant opportunity seemed to have been thwarted. For on the last day of winter, a now thin and gaunt redhead was at the maze entrance once more. Despite her weakened constitution, she climbed up the mountain without waiting for spring to fully bloom, for such was her obsession to claim rightful conquest over the maze. For all of the bedridden winter, she had been dreaming of nothing else but what lies at its center. And throughout the cold months under warm sheets, a nagging curiosity became her constant companion, searing the need to find out into her very soul. And so in this morning, a resolute fire burned in her eyes, as she entered the labyrinth. As she suspected, her map easily brought her to the yellow flag, then the red flag she left long ago. And as she expected, she immediately got lost afterwards. Easily finding the flags and then promptly getting lost right after, would have frustrated her months ago. But this time, after all her experiences in the maze, it merely put a cynical smile on her face. For it once again reinforced her belief that the labyrinth was enchanted. The day wore on, and it was no longer a surprise to her when she repeatedly lost her way, only to find her way back to the red flag. But because she anticipated it, she aimlessly plodded on. Because she expected to be repeatedly led astray, she threw on a mantle of aloofness. She acted as if she didn't care anymore. For it was true anyway, that she didn't really care anymore. As it turned out, the episodes of warm nostalgia and flaming curiosity that somehow comforted her when she was bedridden, were nothing more than a feverish front she put up. For very soon, she would be stepping out of her old life, and venturing out into the new. She returned to the labyrinth at this time for a final attempt, for tomorrow she would relocate to the next valley to make a fresh start for herself. So in a way, it didn't really matter anymore to her if she got ahead in the maze. In a manner of sorts, this was her way of saying goodbye. Perhaps the maze sensed it. Or perhaps the maze took pity on her ravaged frame, or perhaps the maze finally acknowledged her. For whatever reason, it wasn't even late afternoon yet when she found herself in a rather warmer part of the labyrinth. And born of familiarity with such phenomena within the maze, the young lady knew once more that she had found herself in a new part of the labyrinth. 
but instead of elation, only the slightest hint of joy flickered across her face. Despite there being enough light left before evening, she merely planted a green flag to mark this last position, and made her way back to the entrance then went home. All of which, the invisible and silent watcher witnessed. But instead of growing from concern to worry, he too sensed a change in the girl's demeanor, and felt she might never return, despite leaving a third flag in the maze. And so, spring came to the courtyard of the maze, and with it the absence of the young lady. It was a wet spring that visited that year, with the rains coming early and seemingly staying unnecessarily longer. Storms came, and floods swept the forests and the valley. Life went on in the woods and in the towns below, for it was a season of abundant growth. The silent and undisturbed normalcy of everything around the ruined castle returned and the prince made preparations to destroy the maze once it gets dry enough in the summer, and a fire would not be suspicious. The idyllic and almost pastoral silence and solitude around the ruins continued towards the end of spring. Seedlings were sprouting here and there. Insects were buzzing hither and yon. And all manner of forest denizens were scurrying and running about everywhere. For the valley was bursting with life and preparing for a much-awaited summer, after the harsh cold and drenching rains. Indeed, everything seemed to be back to normal. So it was with great surprise that the elven prince found the girl once more at the entrance of the maze, on the summer's eve. The girl had returned to the maze on the last day of spring, for tomorrow would be her birthday and the anniversary of when she first entered the corridors of well-manicured thorny hedges. But this time, there were signs of neglect, for the caretaker had died back then, and she buried her a year ago behind the now abandoned and derelict cottage. Time flew, she thought to herself, as she recalled all her adventures within the verdant thorny walls. She fondly remembered the never-ending frustrations of summer, she affectionately recalled the disheartening discouragements of autumn. And she warmly reminisced on the last indifferent day of winter, before she left the valley for a new life a season ago. And it was still that. A new life lived in a different place, for she was merely visiting her old town. And on this day before her birthday, she would lovingly wander the maze once more. And without missing a stride, and without the help of her map, she went in and reached the green flag in no time, not even once making a wrong turn and losing her way. She knew the path well, for it had been burned into her mind all the time she was away. She missed the maze so much that she wandered its winding passages in her thoughts so many times. And with that, she committed the map she made to memory and knew it like the back of her hand and so straight away to the green flag she went. She wasn't even curious nor concerned why a part of the maze was still cold and covered with what appeared to be snow, as she passed the court of winter, nonchalantly dismissing the phenomena as a snap frost or something, nothing out of the ordinary. And after a magical hour or so of effortless progress and blissful wandering through the court of spring, she finally found her way to the center of the labyrinth, as she entered the meadow at the heart of the maze, she was immediately struck by its majestic and breathtaking beauty. For spread in front of her was a lush meadow, its foliage dancing in the warm caressing breeze, its myriad colored tiny flowers keeping in time with each fragrant breath. And at the center of this clearing stood an astoundingly formidable tree that bespoke a close kinship with time its massive trunk bravely defying the advance of the seasons. Its strong branches proudly bearing the weight of flourishing leaf-laden boughs. Its thick crown of leaves lazily rustling in time with the playful wind. This amazing sight suffused with golden light was truly wonderful and spectacular to behold. All this time, the surprised elven prince followed her into the maze for the first time. 
and surprise turned into astonishment and wonder, as the young girl of almost 21 effortlessly found her way into the clearing of the ancient tree. And from then on, it all happened so fast, and there was no time for the prince to think and react. After overcoming the infinitely pleasant shock of witnessing such enthralling beauty, she knew she had at last conquered the maze by reaching its heart. And with that, the beautiful young redhead simply took a refreshing deep breath, and slowly exhaled as she admiringly gazed at the ancient tree. Lost in the moment, she could only utter a single word to express her mixed feelings. Finally, and through that single word softly spoken with conviction, she concluded her self-imposed adventure that bridged across the whole of the past year. And without ceremony, she turned her back on the clearing and made her way out of the maze, retrieving her flags as she meant to leave no trace of her past life both in the mountain and in the valley. For tomorrow, on her birthday, she returns to the new life she embraced. As for the prince, Everything occurred in a sudden whirlwind of lightning-fast events, after the girl whispered a word he didn't quite catch. The ancient tree suddenly shuddered, and momentarily flashed a blinding light. It did not split at the center to form a gate, but instead he felt an irresistible energy pulling him towards the tree. Unable to withstand the sudden attractive force, he was sucked violently into the light and was instantaneously transported to the elven lands in the west, to rejoin his kind after eons of separation. All across the known realms it happened. On that fateful day, 21 widely scattered unsuspecting elves were instantaneously brought home all at once. All this, the red-headed lady didn't notice, for her kind was non-magical and thus blind to enchanted things, and things of enchantment. She didn't even notice the slight change in the color of the tree, as she turned for one last look, before she finally left the clearing, never to return. Eleven years ago, she promised herself she would break a curse. And this promise was unknowingly fulfilled on that fateful day on the eve of her 21st birthday for an ancient elven prophecy had been fulfilled. Summer's twin will pass through the gates on the changing of the seasons, and she will command her final bidding. And so it had come to pass. In the last year, the fiery redhead's stubborn tenacity enabled her to cross the threshold between courts at the right time, whether by coincidence, or by luck, or both. She first entered the maze on the last day of spring of last year, after laying the old caretaker to rest. She entered the court of autumn on the last day of summer, after enduring so much frustration. She entered the court of winter on the last day of autumn, after harboring so much doubt. And she entered the court of spring on the last day of winter, despite being weakened by an illness that rendered her bedridden and upon eventually reaching the heart of the labyrinth, after a year's worth of adventure through it, the simplest of harmless utterances forever changed the peoplescape of the world. For in the ancient elven tongue, the word finally means something else entirely. In the ancient elven tongue, it exactly sounded like the haughtily dismissive exhortation the ancient elves uttered to overstaying guests. Be gone, for you are no longer welcome. And with that, the magical tree did her bidding, and all across the known realms the last of the elves disappeared, together with the magical essence of their ancient trees. For such is the fickleness of destiny and fate. And this, is the end of our story. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click like, or leave a comment, or share this with friends. Please consider subscribing for this will help us make more stories. Don't forget to hit the bell or notification icon for the latest videos. Until next time.